Good morning. It's great to be with you. It's also great to be focusing this morning on the subject of the Holy Eucharist. My presentation is entitled, The Fourth Cup, Unveiling the Mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross, based upon a new book of mine. But I want to begin by hearkening back to an experience that I had decades ago when I was still an evangelical seminarian, studying for the ministry, attending a Sunday service at my favorite congregation because the pastor also happened to be my Hebrew professor and Old Testament instructor. He was one of those rare birds who could just make the Bible sing. And there I was with my wife, Kimberly. We were there attending a Palm Sunday service. We just read the Passion narrative, and we sat back to listen to what was ordinarily at least a 45-minute sermon. But in the middle of the sermon, I was struck by something that he did. Because in the middle of his message, he raised a simple question when we were going through verses in John 19, where Jesus says in verse 30, it is finished. And then he paused, and we thought it was a dramatic pause, and he asked us, what do you think it refers to? And I thought, well, that's an effective rhetorical strategy, until I began to realize, along with everybody else, that he had interrupted himself and asked a question that he didn't know the answer to. And so as he just kind of looked out there, it is finished. I'm sitting there thinking, come on, it is our redemption. That's what's finished. And as he spoke again, he said, you know, if you're sitting there thinking that Jesus is speaking of his redemption that is finished, that can't be. Because as Paul points out in Romans 4.25, he was raised for our justification. And he's not resurrected yet. So it can't be our redemption. That would be premature. I'm not sure what it is, so let's just move on. And he did. He moved on, and everybody else moved with him except for me. I am sitting in the pew thinking to myself, you can't do that. You can't ask a question to which you don't know the answer. And so I'm not sure I heard another word that he said for the rest of that sermon, because what I began doing was looking at the passage there in John 19.30. It is finished. Asking myself, what is finished? And by the time the sermon was done and we were leaving the service, I walked out, shook his hand at the back door, and said, you can't do that. He said, do what? Ask a question and then not answer it. He laughed. He said, funny guy, I'm sure you'll find the answer and let me know. Well, I took that as a personal challenge as well as an invitation. And so after lunch, I spent the rest of the afternoon buried in my books. I wanted to find an answer to the question, what was Jesus talking about when he said, it is finished? And so, of course, whenever you're looking at a text that is perplexing, you have to back up and look at it in context. And so what I noticed is what many others have noticed, and that is everything that is happening to our Lord in John 19 is happening in the context of the Passover feast. And so I spent most of that afternoon immersing myself in the historical context, the background of the Passover. And of course, this was a memorial feast that the Jews celebrated on the 14th of Nisan. And, you know, a little bit of study shows you that it's almost impossible for Gentile Christians to appreciate the significance of Passover for first century Jews. I mean, it would almost be like Christmas, Easter, and the 4th of July all rolled into one. And why? Because when you go back to the fateful night described in Exodus 12, you can see the tenth and final sign that God has given to Moses for Israel's salvation is the Passover. The instructions are given there that every Israelite family is to take a lamb, an unblemished male lamb, slaughter the lamb, and then with a hyssop branch, sprinkle the blood on the doorposts. And then, of course, after you have done that, you proceed to roast that lamb, and then you gather as a family, standing around the table, standing, not sitting, because you are ready to flee to freedom under the leadership of Moses, under the power of God, but you eat that lamb. And the meal itself is the climax of the sacrifice. And my study also led me to work on the notion of Passover as the sacrifice and communion meal that sealed the covenant bond between the Lord God 
of Abraham and the Israelites there in Egypt. And so you can see that a covenant is a blood bond that establishes family communion. In this case, it restores that between the Lord God and his people. And so these liturgical feasts, like Passover, were intended to signify and strengthen these bonds of family communion as well as to renew the covenant. And this was an important part of the legacy of Israelite faith. For us to understand what Jesus and his fellow disciples and all of the other Jews were doing there on the 14th of Nisan, you really have to understand this notion of Passover in the light of the covenant. And so I began to realize that the entire succession of events leading up to the crucifixion were basically narrated in the context of the Passover. So, for example, we see that the day of preparation in John 18 is precisely when he is standing before Pilate, sentenced to die. It was about the sixth hour, we read. And John, the evangelist, realized, of course, that the sixth hour was precisely the time that the priests were prescribed to begin slaughtering the lambs for the Passover. How significant that was the moment when Jesus was sentenced to die. And likewise, the identification of Jesus on the cross with the Passover lamb is brought out by John also because he's the only one standing there, the beloved disciple. He's the only one who noticed that while the thieves' legs were broken to expedite their deaths, Jesus was already dead. So his bones were not broken, thus to fulfill the scripture we read in John 19, 33 to 36, not a bone of him shall be broken. Going right back to Exodus 12, 46, where Moses had prescribed that the sacrificial lamb could not have any broken bones. Another link is found in the fact that you have in John 19, 29, that the bowl full of sour wine that stood there was put on a sponge and lifted up on a hyssop branch. Now the other evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, notice that they offered him a drink of sour wine, but they don't tell us whether he drank it or not. Only John tells us because only John was there. And so you can see the hyssop branch for John's narrative is significant because once again in Exodus 12, 22, it was the hyssop branch that was prescribed to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of the Israelite households. John apparently notices another detail. In John 19, 23, we hear about the soldiers drawing lots for his seamless linen garment. The word in Greek for garment, I notice, keton, is the same term used to describe the liturgical vestment worn by the high priest when he offered the sacrifice. So this alerts us to the fact that Jesus is here in the context of the Passover wearing, in effect, what the high priest would wear, while he's also suffering what the Passover lamb would suffer. Without any broken bones, he is offered up. And all of this, for me, was fascinating. Dinner came, and I spent the rest of the evening studying more about this. But I realized at the end of the day, I hadn't found an answer. This was much more involved than I realized. And so in addition to my schoolwork, I was trying to find spare time in the evening to go a little bit deeper because I realized that the Passover back in ancient Egypt, as you read in Exodus 12, is not the whole story. I realized that you also have to kind of contextualize the Passover so that I would understand how it was celebrated by first century Jews like Jesus and his disciples. And so a little bit of research, I found this rabbi who taught at Oxford University in England, Rabbi David Dalby, among others. And all of them pointed out that the Passover meal, as it was celebrated in the first century by Jews, consisted of four parts. And it was easy to identify the sequence of parts because there were four cups. First, the preliminary course consisted of a festival blessing, Kedush in the Hebrew. And Kedush, of course, means sanctification. And so the Kedush cup was the first to be shared by all of the celebrants. And as soon as the Kedush cup, the cup of sanctification, was passed around and shared, they all also partook of bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. And this moved into the second course, which included the recital of the Passover narrative, the Haggadah, along with the singing of the little Hillel, Psalm 113, 
followed by the second cup being shared, which was, of course, the hello cup, the cup of praise. And so what you have here at this moment is the transition into the main course, which is the third part of this. And so after the Haggadah cup or the Hillel cup, you then proceed to the main course, at the end of which you share this cup of Barakah, the cup of blessing. And so after the third cup, the cup of blessing is shared, Rabbi Dalby, again, and other scholars too, pointed out to me that you've reached now the climax of the Passover, or what we might call the Seder meal. And so the Passover would climax after the third cup was shared with the singing of the great Hallel. Hallel, of course, in Hebrew means praise. And so the great Hallel consists of Psalms 114, 115, 116, 117, and 118. And then, of course, you have come to the culminating point, and that is the fourth cup. And so you would drink this fourth cup, the cup of consummation, some call it, except that that's not what happened. When you look into this, the scholarship shows you what it showed me, that the pattern that is narrated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke clearly reflects this Passover structure. For example, in Luke 22, you can hear Luke describe at least two cups that are shared. The second of them is probably the cup of blessing, which was the third cup of the meal. Scholars readily identify this, and then also notice that after Jesus consecrates the third cup, the cup of blessing, we read, and when they sang a hymn in Mark 14, 26. And I notice the scholars all pinpoint this as the moment of transition where you go from the third cup to the fourth cup because the hymn is the great Hallel. Indeed, Paul identifies the Eucharistic cup in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, as the cup of blessing. Now, where in the world did he find that terminology? Well, I hadn't noticed that until I'm looking into the first century Passover, the way first century Jews celebrated. And Paul is, of course, referring to the third cup of the Passover, the cup that Jesus consecrated. But at this point, a significant problem arose in my research because Jesus, instead of proceeding immediately to the climax, the drinking of the fourth cup, instead we read in Mark 14, 26, and when they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, close quote. Now, it might seem difficult for Gentile Christians like you and me, who are not familiar with the Haggadah, the Passover liturgy, to perceive what a serious disorder in the sequence this represents. But it's not lost to Jewish readers who are looking at the gospel the way Rabbi David Dalby did. For them, Jesus is skipping the fourth cup. I have photocopied here a page from his book, The New Testament and Rabbinic Judaism, published back in 1956, which I was reading that night. And so, of the four cups of wine prescribed for the Passover Eve service, the third over which grace is said is to be taken immediately after the supper. According to the synoptics and Paul, this third cup is the cup of the new covenant. Paul actually adapts its technical designation. Leave it to a rabbi to notice these details. There is, however, in Matthew and Mark, a reference also to the fourth and last cup of the Passover liturgy. It is contained in the words that Jesus spoke. I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until I drink it new in my Father's kingdom or in the kingdom of God. The meaning to Rabbi Dalby is clear. The fourth cup will not be taken, at least at the normal time. Now, you know, it's striking to me that these are details that I never noticed. But then, of course, if you invited a Jewish friend to attend a Sunday Mass, and you were sitting there with him, and for whatever reason, this elderly priest pronounced the words of consecration, but then forgot the rite of communion and proceeded to the benediction, Would you notice as a Catholic? Well, of course. Would your Jewish friend notice? Of course not. But in fact, for us, communion is sort of the climax of the Eucharistic liturgy. Well, likewise, the fourth cup is the climax of the Passover liturgy. And so to skip this is no small omission. Now, scholars who notice this problem, I discovered over the course of more study, over the course of weeks, are asking the question, why did he skip it? 
Well, it's almost as though the goal of the Passover was missed. So I noticed that Jesus says this important statement. I say to you, I shall not drink it again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom. It's almost as though Jesus was alerting his disciples that he was not going to drink what they were expecting him to drink and share with them. A couple scholars I found speculated that psychological factors might account for Jesus' forgetfulness. They point out how subsequently we read in Mark 14, 32, he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Perhaps our Lord was just too upset to be bothered with liturgical precision in following the rubrics. Well, that kind of analysis might seem plausible. Further reflection led me to think that it's highly unlikely. For one thing, if Jesus is so distracted and confused, it seems doubtful that he would forget and interrupt the Passover liturgy expressly declaring his intention not to drink the fourth cup, especially since he goes ahead anyway and sings the great Hallel. Why would he declare himself so plainly before acting in such a disorderly manner? All of his other actions that night struck me as a man admittedly distressed, but in full possession of himself. So then the question remained, why then did he choose not to drink? I hadn't found an answer, and it was weeks after Palm Sunday, but I was continuing my search up until the time I was getting ready for graduation from seminary. This is when I was led to a third stage in my own research. The third stage basically leads me to something obvious. When they went out to the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane, notice what Jesus prays, not once or twice, but three times. We read in Matthew 26, Going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Three times he prays to his father, Abba, Father, for him to take away this cup. Now, an obvious question arises, what cup is Jesus speaking of? Well, I looked at the commentaries, and some of them speculated that this could be a reference to Isaiah 51, 17, or Jeremiah 25, 15, where we read about the cup of God's wrath being drunk all the way down to the bottom, to the dregs. And perhaps there is a connection to Isaiah and Jeremiah, but it seems less direct than the primary link suggested by the overall Passover setting especially when you notice that he drank the third but skipped the fourth and went out to pray three times, take away this cup, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And notice also how Jesus states his resolution that he's not going to taste of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom is coming, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. And it's interesting too, because what I noticed there in Mark 15, 23, is that on the way up to Golgotha, What did they offer him? Wine mingled with myrrh, and he refused it. Well, no wonder, because he had pledged not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until it was fulfilled in the kingdom. So what does that mean, fulfilled in the kingdom? On the surface, we would expect it to be sort of pointing to the second coming, when the kingdom of God's glory is finally manifested. But this is when I went back to John's gospel And I discovered a fourth and final clue. And that is how John depicts the kingdom is different than how Matthew, Mark, and Luke present it. Of course, we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. About 80% of what they share is in common. Whereas John's gospel is clearly distinct. I would propose that John's gospel is not in any way contradictory, but complementary. That there is something deliberately symphonic and supplemental about what John is doing. For example, when John has Jesus coming out of the garden and the soldiers are getting ready to arrest him, Peter draws the sword and John notices that he cuts off Malchus's ear, which Jesus heals as his last miracle before his passion. And then John adds what the other evangelists don't mention, and that is he turns to Peter and says, shall I not drink of the cup which my father has willed? Now, that's significant because John doesn't have the cup sayings in the Gethsemane prayer. 
John doesn't even have the details about the cups in the upper room. And so John is clearly signaling to his reader that they know the synoptic tradition, and now I'm sort of filling in the gaps because Jesus knows that he must drink the cup willed by the Father. But when I continued reading John's gospel, I discovered this element that scholars refer to as Johannine irony, that irony is throughout John's gospel. Well, what is irony? Irony is sort of when you get the opposite of what you expect. And so when you think about what it means for Jesus to fulfill the plan of God in the covenant, for the kingdom of God to be fully manifested, John shows us a different perspective. Because in John chapter 12, we read that when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself, casting out the prince of this world. This he said to show what? How he would come again and defeat Satan at the end of time? No, John adds, this he said to show by what death he was to die. So in typical Johannine fashion, John is showing us that the moment when Satan seems to triumph is in fact when Satan is being defeated. And at that same moment when it looks like defeat for our Lord who's hanging on the cross, in fact, this is the victory when the prince of this world is cast out when all men will be drawn to himself. And why? Because the cross represents the supreme expression of divine mercy and love. So he's not losing his life there at Calvary as much as he is making it a gift of love. And love is the essential force of the kingdom of God. And it is at that moment when the kingdom is truly being fulfilled from John's perspective. So months into my research, I'm sort of gathering up the fragments, you might say. Because I am curious to figure out, okay, okay, exactly where have I been? What ground have I covered? The first thing I recalled was the Passover back in Exodus, how it was the first time around. The second step was looking at the Passover liturgy, the way first century Jews like Jesus would have celebrated it. And then the third stage was noticing the prayer in Gethsemane where Jesus prays three times, for the Father to take away this cup, and then he gives heartfelt consent to drinking it all. And then this fourth and final element showed me that from John's perspective, the triumph of Jesus' purpose, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, does not come at the end of time, nor is it associated just with the resurrection. In fact, it is when the Son of Man is lifted up drawing all to himself, casting out the prince of this world. And so there I was going back again to the fourth gospel. Because only in the gospel of John do we read about what happened when they offered him the sour wine. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, once again, you hear that they offered him the wine. And if that's all we had were the three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'd probably conclude that he didn't drink it because after all, On the way to Golgotha, he refused the wine. But once again, only John tells us what he did because only John is there as an eyewitness. And so in John 19, let's go back and reread verses 28 to 30. We read, a bowl full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, that's when he says, it is is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In a moment, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I realized that I'd found the answer to my question. The it that was finished was the Passover liturgy that he had begun with the disciples in the upper room and then interrupted. And why? Because more precisely, the it that was finished was not simply the Passover of the old covenant, but Jesus' fulfillment of that and its transformation of the Passover of the Old Covenant into the Passover sacrifice of the New Covenant. And so that's when he drinks the third cup, skips the fourth, goes to Gethsemane, and then up to Golgotha, and manifests the supremacy of God in life-giving love by dying on the cross. Not losing, but rather giving his life. So what about that fourth cup? Precisely at the moment of his death, he drinks from the bowl of sour wine and partakes of the fourth cup. And once again, 
Ironically, the hour of Jesus' crucifixion and death constitutes no defeat. Rather, this is the hour that he manifests the glory of the kingdom and enters into paradise with that thief, just as he said he would. So I had come to realize that Scripture teaches that the Passover sacrifice of the new covenant actually begins in the upper room while he's celebrating the Passover, in the context of which he institutes the Eucharist that we are so much more familiar with than first century Jews, than we would be with the Passover. I also came to realize that this Passover sacrifice of the lamb in the old is now being fulfilled by the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. The sacrifice did not begin at Calvary. It began in the upper room. And the Passover was not complete when they went out to the Mount of Olives. Rather, the Passover is complete precisely there on Calvary. It didn't occur to me at the time that this matched or corresponded perfectly with what the Catholic Church teaches. I was still anti-Catholic in my general outlook. I was now an evangelical Presbyterian minister, and I had never read a single Catholic theologian or an account of the Mass, nor had I attended Mass, nor did I ever want to, because for us, the Mass was re-sacrificing Jesus, and it constituted sacrilege, if not blasphemy. And so, here I was, one evening, teaching a course at a local seminary. And I had about a dozen seminarians, and I'm going through the material in the Gospel of John as well as the Synoptic Gospels, raising the question to them, what does Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? What was finished? And sure enough, there was an answer. Our redemption. Nope. Romans 4.25, he is raised for our justification, and that hasn't happened yet. So they're looking at me, wondering, what other answer is there? And so I walked them through the steps. And as I got to the end, I shared with them what I had discovered on my own, or so I thought, that the only way to really understand the meaning of Jesus' words or the mystery of what happened there at Golgotha is by backing up and looking at Calvary in the light of the upper room, the Passover, the Eucharist, the transformation of the old into the new, and then the prayer where he gives heartfelt consent to the Father's will to drink the cup, which he doesn't drink until he sees that it is all finished. And then he declares that solemn phrase, it is finished, which is sort of like the cup of consummation. And so as I was wrapping up the lecture, I sort of asked them, I want you to think about the following before our class next week. When did Jesus' sacrifice begin? Was it at Calvary? And this kid in the back row raised his hand. And I said, think about it a week. You have some time. But he began to wave it. And then groaning, oh, oh, oh. Well, whenever that happens, that's sort of what the, the bane of an instructor's existence is, you know. Because reluctantly, you have to call on him. And, and so John said, it's clear that the sacrifice didn't begin on Good Friday at Calvary. It began on Holy Thursday in the upper room. And I said, okay, you can see the link. Then I want you to spend the week thinking about this. When does the Passover of the new covenant reach its climax? And his hand was up again a second time. Come on now, John, think about it for a week. And he is moaning and groaning again so reluctantly. What is it now? He said, well, it's obvious too that the Passover sacrifice begun in the Passover in the upper room. It didn't end until Calvary. And like, okay, so you can see that the Eucharist, the Last Supper, and Calvary, Jesus' crucifixion, basically illuminate each other. They explain one another. They're mutually interpretive. You can't understand either one without the other because they're one in the same sacrifice. And then his hand went up a third time. And I'm thinking, that wasn't a question. And so, once again, with some reluctance, I said, what is it now? He said, that's exactly what I learned when I was a kid growing up studying the, the Baltimore Catechism. And I looked at him. You mean the Westminster Catechism? I never heard of the Baltimore Catechism, much less read it. And what the Westminster Catechism is what we used as Presbyterians. He said, no, I was raised Catholic, and the nuns in school used the Baltimore Catechism to teach us, and that's what they taught us. And I remember just thinking to myself as I'm mopping the sweat from my brow, 
I'm in trouble. You know, and I'm like, I don't think that's the case. And he said, you ought to look into it. <laughs> well, funny thing, because the next week I did look into it. I found me an old battered copy of the Baltimore Catechism. And sure enough, it's exactly what the Baltimore Catechism taught. I didn't want to teach anything that was Catholic, but I also didn't want in any way to just give in to fear and turn away from the scriptures and to kind of sin against the light because the light of God's word is what shone. And I realized this was leading me to a much deeper and more coherent and beautiful explanation of how it was there on Holy Thursday and how it was also on Good Friday. To make a long story short, I ended up in search of a church that matched what I was finding on the pages of sacred scripture. Because what I was finding on the pages of scripture wasn't just the events that transpired from Holy Thursday through Good Friday to Easter Sunday. I began to realize that there is much more to it than that. In fact, I began to realize that if you back up one year and look into John's gospel, there in chapter 6, you realize that Jesus, after feeding the 5,000 and filling the baskets, the 12 baskets with the leftovers, proceeds on in the synagogue there at Capernaum to give us the famous bread of life discourse in the context of the Passover, John 6, verse 4. So there in John 6, on another evening, in fact, it was the next week of that seminary course on the Gospel of John, I'm looking with them at what Jesus said to the disciples and all of the people that he fed. Because he says to them in verse 51, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I'm only speaking figuratively. Well, that's not what he said. <laughs> That's what I expected him to say. That's what I wanted him to say. But when I looked more closely at what he was saying to prepare my lectures, I realized that he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Just kidding. No, he didn't add that either. In fact, what he goes on to say is not just once or twice or three times, but four times. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. You know, four times he says it. And I'll be honest, I had never heard a single sermon ever preached to explain what he meant and why he said it that way. I must have heard dozens of sermons on what Jesus says in John 3, you must be born again, which he only says once, but not a single paragraph in a homily about what Jesus is talking about here. I could really relate to what we read in verse 60. In John 6, verse 60, we read, many of the disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? He had just fed the thousands, but they were taking such offense at what he was now teaching that they began to fall away. They began to leave. So I went and looked at it more closely because this must be a mistranslation. So the closer I looked at the Greek, the more I discovered that sure enough, Jesus is speaking at first about eating using a Greek word, estheo, four times. There in verses 49 to 53. And that term can often be used figuratively. And of course, it must be used figuratively here. It's like what's eating you is not literal, but figurative. Except that what Jesus goes on to say in the next few verses about eating his flesh and drinking in my blood, he changes the verb to the Greek term trago, which doesn't just mean eat. It means to chew, to masticate, to munch. No wonder they were so shocked. This is a hard saying. It can't be taken figuratively. And so when he realizes what's happening, we read in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him, Jesus turned to the 12. He doesn't ask them, why didn't one of you stop me? I was only speaking figuratively. He clearly 
meant what he said and he said what he meant, but I wasn't understanding him. And it was apparent to me that neither did Peter. Jesus said to the 12, do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. I could relate to Peter because, you know, he didn't say, hey, they're outsiders. They don't have a clue as to what you're referring to, but we're the insiders. We understand your esoteric teaching. Hold still while we chew your arms and legs. No, it doesn't work that way. No, what Simon Peter was basically saying was, we don't have a clue as to what you're talking about, but we assume that you do. And it was like I was being asked to extend a line of credit to our Lord, which is never a bad idea, which is also what Simon Peter was doing. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. On the one hand, he's asking, to whom shall we go? Is there any other rabbi whose teaching is so profound, who performs miracles? Can you recommend him? But no, of course there isn't. So he goes on to confess the fact that we have come to believe that you're the Holy One of God. And so Peter's basically saying, we don't understand, but we trust you. And I'll be honest, in preparing my lecture for this seminary course, I was facing that same dilemma because I wasn't sure how to teach this. I wasn't sure how to understand it. I was sure that the, that the Lord understood what he meant and he said what he meant and meant what he said. And then I made a big mistake. I went to look into the writings of the early church fathers how do they understand the meaning of Jesus' words? And I read different fathers, Ambrose and Augustine and St. John Chrysostom and Irenaeus, but the one who really opened my eyes was St. Augustine. He said in a couple of places that the only way to really understand what Jesus means is to notice when Jesus gave the Bread of Life discourse immediately after feeding the multitude with the the five loaves and the two fish and filling the 12 baskets full to symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel because in John 6 verse 4 we read that the Passover of the Jews was at hand. So this is the second to last Passover he'll ever celebrate and what he's doing is preparing his disciples for what he knows will happen one year later when he celebrates the final Passover because he won't just celebrate it one last time, he will fulfill the Passover of the old precisely by establishing the Passover of the new and so, what is it that you need to celebrate the Passover? What already seen? Because back in Exodus 12, you had to take a lamb, an unblemished male lamb with no broken bones, you had to slaughter the lamb, you had to sprinkle the blood, but then you had to roast the lamb and eat the lamb together as a family gathered around the table with staff in hand, ready to flee to freedom, but you had to eat the lamb. It was not an option. In fact, it was the climax of the Passover. And so if this is what Jesus is not only celebrating one last time, one year later, after his Bread of Life discourse, but precisely what Jesus is going to fulfill by establishing the Passover, the new covenant, then of course the lamb is going to have to die. He's going to also have to pour out his blood for the forgiveness of sins, but he will also need to make provisions for the communion meal of the new Passover. And for St. Augustine and the other patristic sources I read, this is exactly why he said what he said when he said it in John 6. Because one year later, they would finally understand what Jesus alone knew one year earlier, that he'd have to lay his life down. He'd have to pour his blood out, but he would also have to make provisions. Suppose back in Egypt, you decided as a family that none of us like mutton. So, Mama, why don't you bake some matzah in the form of a lamb and we'll eat that in remembrance of Moses. Well, if you had proceeded to do that instead of eating the lamb, you would have awakened and the firstborn would be dead. Because it wasn't enough to slaughter the lamb. It wasn't enough to sprinkle the blood. You had to eat the lamb whether you liked lamb or not because that was the climax of the Passover. And if that was true in the old, it isn't less but more true in the new. And so Jesus gives the instructions because he knows he will make the provisions and thus the disciples will come to see a year later with his death and resurrection through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The mystery of the Last Supper will be unveiled at the cross because there we will see the fourth cup, the fulfillment of the kingdom, the manifestation of the power of God's kingdom precisely in that love that is life-giving as our Lord manifested it. Well, 
after I'd come to these conclusions, I was in search of a church. I had submitted my resignation. I ended up looking into this more and more, reading the fathers more and more, but finding more and more clues in the scriptures as well. For example, we used to always say that the mass is wrong because Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. As we read, for example, in Hebrews 7.27, this once for all sacrifice points to the fact that the mass can't be a sacrifice because then Jesus would be sacrificed again and again. When it's once for all, it's over and done, it's terminated. And I took all of my findings into the text of Hebrews and I discovered this insight kept growing like a snowball rolling down the hill because there in Hebrews 7, what we read is about Jesus. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then those for his people. He did this once for all when he offered up himself. And this is why he is a priest forever. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And then in the next section of Hebrews chapter 8, we read, and I saw for the first time, that the point in what we were saying is this, that we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary in the true tent, which is set up not by man, but by the Lord, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. But where does he offer it? In heaven. What is he offering? Cattle, sheep, and goats? No, he's offering his body, which was given to them in the upper room in the form of the Eucharist. His body, which then knelt down and prayed three times, take away this cup, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And then that same body that was hanging on the cross, the same body that was buried in the tomb, that same body that was resurrected from the dead is now ascended into heaven and enthroned at the right hand of God as not only a king, but a royal high priest. And so he's a priest forever because he's got a priestly ministry and every priest is appointed to offer sacrifice. So what is the sacrifice that Jesus now offers? It isn't cattle, sheep, and goats like those who did it on earth. It is his glorified body. But it's the same sacrifice as what was initiated in the upper room. The same sacrifice that is consummated on the cross. The same sacrifice that is now present in heaven on our behalf as the Son presents to the Father his glorified humanity, which is not only glorified but deified, and it's what glorifies and deifies us as well. You can't freeze frame this and say the sacrifice is only Calvary. That is the climax indeed of what was begun in the upper room. But Jesus is a heavenly high priest and what he is offering up in heaven is what we share through the power of the Holy Spirit in the Holy Eucharist. But this is the meaning of once for all. It's not once and for all over and done. It's not once and for all in the sense of termination. It's once and for all in the sense of everlasting. It's once and for all in the sense that Jesus' sacrifice is perpetuated. In the sacrifice, we are not repeatedly sacrificing Jesus because how can you repeat something that is never ending? Jesus now stands in heaven before the Father and offers his glorified humanity. And that same sacred humanity is what we receive in Holy Communion as the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. But this is the meaning of once for all not over and done, but continuous, not terminated, but perpetuated. It's the only reason why the text says he continues a priest forever. It wasn't that he was a priest for several hours or a few days, but when he finally got up to heaven and sat down, he retired. No, he is offering himself as both priest and victim. And this is the only thing that unlocked the door for me to show that instead of condemning the sacrifice of the Mass, the book of Hebrews was teaching it the same way I found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and especially John 19, 28 to 30. John chapter 6, verses 51 to 66. Over and over again, things just keep coming up Catholic. And so, naturally, this is what it led me to see. But what I also want to share is this.
the practical implications for us today. Because if, in fact, Jesus shared the fourth cup at the cross and gives to us the cup of blessing in each and every mass to drink from, when do we share the fourth cup? At the hour of our death. Did you ever wonder why we pray so many times, pray for us now and at the hour of our death? I'm a professor. I know what it's like to teach, but I also know what it's like to test. And the final exam is always the moment of truth. And our last hour is, in a sense, that moment of truth. What I found in the early church fathers was this insight into what it is that Jesus established. Because if the Passover in the Old Covenant is what led Israel out of Egyptian bondage into the inheritance of the promised land, all of that is just an earthly figure that prefigures something much greater, and that is the new and greater Moses. The new Passover of the new covenant bringing about a new exodus that leads us not out of Egyptian bondage, but bondage to sin and to death. So that through Jesus, a new way has been opened into a much greater inheritance, a far more glorious promised land, which of course is heaven. And that is what we will reach when we come to the hour of our death. And it's an interesting fact that I discovered also that this is associated not just with the hour of death, but with drinking the cup. One of my favorite accounts in the early church fathers is this account of the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. Polycarp, as you know, was the bishop of Smyrna in the second century. And at the ripe old age of 86 was martyred. But there were eyewitnesses who described not only the circumstances, but also the climax of his final prayer. I'm going to read from this, if you don't mind. As Polycarp stepped into the arena, there came a voice from heaven. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. No one caught sight of the speaker, but those of our friends who were there heard the voice. He was then brought before the governor, who tried to persuade him to recant. Polycarp, have some respect for your years, he said. Just swear an oath by Caesar. And then he pointed to the Christians and say, denounce them. Say, down with the infidels. Polycarp's brow darkened as he threw a look around the turbulent crowd of heathen in the circus and then indicating them instead with a sweep of his hand, he said with a growl and a glance up to heaven, down with the infidels. The governor still went on pressing him, take the oath, I'll let you go, revile your Christ. Polycarp replied, for 80 and six years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And then the witnesses go on to describe how it was all done in less, than, less time than it takes to tell. In a moment, the crowd had collected firewood and kindling. The irons with which the pyre was equipped were fastened around him, bound with his hands, tied behind him. He was like a noble ram taken out of some great flock for sacrifice. Notice the liturgical image a holy burnt offering already for God. And then he cast his eyes up to heaven and said, and listened to his prayer, O Lord God Almighty, Father of your blessed and beloved Son, Jesus Christ, I bless you for granting me this day and this hour that I may be numbered among the martyrs to share the cup of your anointed and to rise again unto life everlasting, both in body and soul, in the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received among them this day in your presence, a sacrifice rich and acceptable. Amen. Historians notice phrases that are actually lifted from the ancient Eucharistic liturgy, as well as the Passover, as well as the gospel text of drinking the cup there at the cross. The eyewitnesses conclude the account as Polycarp's great amen soared up and the prayer ended, the men at the fire set their lights to it, and a great sheet of flame blazed out. And then we who were privileged to witness it saw a most wondrous sight, and we have been spared to tell it to the rest of you. For the fire took on the shape of a hollow chamber and formed a wall around the martyr's figure, and there he was in the center of it, not like a human being in flames, but like a loaf baking in the oven. And we all became aware of a delicious fragrance, like the odor of incense. 
Finally, when they realized that his body could not be destroyed by fire, the ruffians ordered one of the dagger men to go up and stab him with his weapon, and he did so. And when he did, there flew out of the fire a dove, together with such a copious rush of blood that the flames were extinguished, filling the spectators with awe to see the greatness of the difference that separates unbelievers from the elect of God. We all know what the mortality rate is for earthlings. It's 100%. None of us are going to get out of here alive. We're all going to come to the hour of death. But there we're going to have a choice. But it's not a choice that we'll simply make at that moment. It's a choice that we will make at this moment and every subsequent moment leading up to the hour of death, that moment. Because if, in fact, we give consent to Jesus' sacrifice for us and for our sins, then, indeed, we will receive the grace to pass in a new and greater exodus and the drink from our fourth cup so that all of the cups of blessing, all of the times that we have partaken of the body and blood of Christ will prepare us for that moment when we can say it is finished. Even if we're not tortured, even if we're not martyred, we can still be a martus. The Greek word for martyr, martus means witness. The Greek word marturia is the term in Greek for testimony. We can be witnesses and give testimony to the world through our lives by living out the mystery that we celebrate in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, by allowing our Lord to reproduce his love, his life, his suffering, and his death while we offer it up until that final moment when we all drink from the fourth cup. But every Mass and every communion will lead us to that hour, to that moment, to that cup. St. Augustine also extols what he calls the martyr's cup. He said in one of his sermons, number 329, you have sat down at a great table. Consider carefully what is set before you. Since you ought to prepare the same kind of thing yourself, it is certainly a great table. For the Lord of the table is himself the banquet. No one feeds his guests on himself. But that is what the Lord Christ did being himself the host, himself the food and drink. Therefore, the martyrs recognized what they ate and drink so that they could live out the same kind of thing. What shall I give to the Lord for all that he has done for me? I will take up the cup of salvation. What is this cup? The bitter but salutary and saving cup of suffering. This is what the cup is. We can recognize this cup on the lips of our Lord when he says, Father, if it be so, let this cup pass from me. Oh, how blessed are those who drink this cup. This is what invests every moment of our lives with meaning. But this is also what illuminates the mystery of how Christ's death saves us. Let me conclude by quoting from my favorite theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, who says, and I quote, by suffering out of love and obedience, Christ gave more to God, the Father, than what was required to compensate for all the sins of the human race. Think about it. The debt that we have incurred by sinning against the holy God. Countless times. An immeasurable debt. And yet what Christ gave back to the Father through his love and obedience was much more than what we took away. Why? Aquinas continues. First, because of the exceeding charity from which Jesus suffered. Second, because the dignity of the life that he laid down in atonement, for it was the life of one who is both God and man. And third, because of the extent of the passion and the greatness of the grief that he endured. He concludes, thus Christ's passion was not only sufficient for our sins, but superabundant atonement for our sins. Indeed, Aquinas concludes, Christ's love was so much greater than his slayer's malice that the value of his passion in atoning surpassed the murderous guilt of his crucifiers, such that Christ's suffering is sufficient and superabundant atonement even for the sin of his murderers, unquote. And haven't we all, in effect, contributed to his death by our sin? by turning away from the infinite grace of God for the finite goods of this world. As one martyr wrote in his journal before he faced death, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep. 
in order to gain what he can never lose. We can't keep anything in this world, nor can we take it with us. And so when we're called upon to sacrifice what it is that God has given us out of greater love for the giver of the gifts, it is a very reasonable exchange. But for God, the Son, to become the suffering servant, to transform sinful servants into beloved sons and daughters. This is what the mystery of the cross is. This is what the Passover, the new covenant, illuminates. This is why we can't understand either one without the other. What Jesus is doing, celebrating the Passover of the old, fulfilling it by instituting the new, by taking it all the way to the cross, drinking the fourth cup at the moment of death, bringing about the new and greater exodus, the new and greater covenant, not for himself because he gained nothing from all of this that he lacked before he became a man. Being God, he lacked nothing. Becoming a man, he gained nothing. So why bother? It wasn't to gain stuff for himself, it was to give it to us, and he lavishes not only his love, but his life as well. I am convinced that this is the most precise explanation of how Jesus' death saves us much to be preferred to the Protestant notion of penal substitution. That for a few hours, God the Father looked down from heaven and could no longer see his son, whom he loved. He could only see our sins heaped upon him. And so instead of loving his son, he heaped his wrath and vented his rage upon him as a victim. That is what is often proclaimed as the gospel. That is a counterfeit. That is not only a misinterpretation, that is a gross and virtually blasphemous distortion of what is happening. It's out of love and obedience that the Son offers it to the Father. And I think it would also be true to say this, that when God the Father looked down from heaven upon his Son throughout his 33 years, his sacred humanity was always lovely and always beloved, but never so lovely as the moment when he gave consent to the cup and went to Golgotha and hung on the cross, not losing but giving his life, not suspending the love of the Father, but expressing the love of the Father, precisely because a Father's love in the Trinity is life-giving love. And that's what Jesus is doing through his sacred humanity. He's making his life a gift of love, not only then, but now in the Holy Eucharist, and not only for us, but through us as well. He doesn't just bestow, he doesn't just bear a cross for us, He bestows a cross on us. He calls us to carry the cross, to drink of the cup, but not before he continually gives us again and again the cup of blessing, the third cup that he shared with the disciples, knowing that all all of them would share in the fellowship of his sufferings. This is the one thing that explains everything. It's traceable back to the inner life of God, the Holy Trinity, who is life-giving love from all eternity, and calls us to that goal. The only reason for which we were made was to enter into that life, and the only way we can is by allowing that life to enter into us through the sacrifice of the cross, through the sacrifice of the Mass, through the love and the power of the Holy Spirit. I am convinced that it is time for us, as Catholics, to lay hold of this, not by becoming graduate students in theology, but becoming faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what transformed my understanding of the gospel. But even more, this is what opened my eyes to the mystery of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Through the eyes of faith, we behold something that is really greater than this whole world can contain. And yet here we are in the world to celebrate this. And so let's ask our Lord to increase our faith along with the endurance of hope to perfect our charity as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your eternal Son, our Savior. We thank you for manifesting to us, through him, a love that goes beyond anything we've ever known, from our parents, from our siblings and friends, because you have established through the Holy Eucharist a bond of friendship, a covenant of love, and we thank you for it, but we also ask you in the holy name of Jesus for the gift of the Holy Spirit, minds with the word of your truth, to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your love,
that we might not only be informed by your word, but also transformed into saints. So hear us as we pray that family prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.